All right. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Blerda, and I am with the Gitcoin team. And thank you so much uh, for joining in this session. Uh, today, we have Joe from Algorand uh, on a session about how Algorand works. Uh, just a few things before we get started. Uh, first, this session uh, is being recorded, and you can always watch it on our Gitcoin media channel on YouTube under the Greenhouse Hacks playlist. Uh, then you can always say hello uh, in the chat here so we know where you're watching from. Uh, it's a great way for uh, all of us to get to know each other. And if you have any questions throughout the session, please just go ahead and list them in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll make sure to answer them um, here at the end. Um, all right. Uh, and with that, I'll just turn it over to Joe. All right, everyone. Uh, so my name is Joe Polney. I'm a developer relations engineer over at Sorry, I might have been muted that time. Um, <clears throat> so let me just go back. So uh, as you just saw, this is going to be the agenda for today. So we're going to be going over some background information. So uh, you know why one might want to build on Algorand, the, how the network is structured, how the consensus works, and some of the layer one features. And then we're going to be going over smart contracts. So how smart contracts work on Algorand and the different ways you can use them. And then we'll be taking an in-depth look at applications on Algorand. And these are kind of the main uh, types of smart contracts you'll be using. And then for uh, the end of the session, we're going to be going over some educational content and developer resources. And the point of this entire session is that you get the base information you should know before you start building on Algorand. And then I'll give you some of the next steps in your building journey and how to learn more about Algorand. So the first thing I want to talk about is why Algorand. Um, so uh, kind of the high level summary is that Algorand is a great experience for the end user that uses your application built on Al Algorand. And it's a good user experience for a couple of different reasons. Uh, the first of which is that it's fast. So Algorand has a four and a half second block time with instant finality. And this basically means that when an end user submits a transaction in four and a half seconds, they'll know whether that transaction failed or succeeded. And they don't have to wait for any additional confirmations. On some other chains, the block time is a bit longer. And even when the block finalizes, it uh, isn't guaranteed that that block will be in the blockchain. Uh, so with Algorand, there's no potential forking. So when a block is added to the chain, it will um, surely be in the chain going forward. So any transaction, it's instantly final in four and a half seconds. Algorand is also very scalable. So right now we're capable of handing around a thousand transactions per second. And just to give some context to this number, most chains they're averaging around, you know, like 20 to maybe 50 transactions per second. So a thousand TPS 
uh, even in its current state, is a ton of room to grow. And then we're also very cheap. So this is the transaction fee. It's 0 0.001 algo. And, you know, of course, this depends on what the coin is trading at, but this equates around like a 40th of a penny. So it's very cheap. And this means that it's something that the end user doesn't really have to worry about. And the nice thing about fees on Algorand is that it's the same for every type of transaction. So whether you're just sending someone some algo, swapping NFTs, or executing a complex smart contract, it'll always be 0 0.001 algo. In addition to be fast, scalable, and cheap, we're also really stable. So mainnet has been up on Algorand for around three years. And in that entire time, we haven't seen any downtime on mainnet. And this is including with uh, recent 1,000 TPS stress tests. So as I mentioned earlier, the max, you know, Theoretical limit of transactions per second is a thousand, and Algorand actually tests the network itself at that max threshold, making sure the network doesn't go down, and it hasn't. And of course, like every other blockchain, decentralization is very important. And I'll talk a little bit more about the network structure in the next slide. Um, but we are decentralized. We have a thousand plus nodes and a really strong consensus mechanism that really helps strengthen the de decentralization of the network as a whole. And then also another great thing about Algorand is that it's constantly improving. So uh, just in the next couple of months, we'll be moving down from four and a half second block time to a four second block time. We'll also be increasing the block size. And those two things combined together will result in a 6x increase in TPS, so 6,000 TPS going forward. And then I'll talk about this uh, a little bit later in slides, but there's constantly new features being added as well. So new features for smart contracts, new features for the protocol. Um, basically, the point is that Algorand is constantly improving, and we'd like to listen to our community, and we find it important to... Uh, constantly improve our chain so that we can reach the goals of, um, you know, a truly decentralized finance network. Okay, so uh, what does the network look like? So there are kind of three different nodes that are all active in the network. So the first one is participation nodes, and these are the nodes that allow accounts to participate in consensus. And so these nodes have the last 1,000 blocks, and they can take in new transactions and participate in consensus and whether those transactions should be added to the blockchain or not. And I'll be talking a little bit more about consensus in the next slide, but these are kind of the primary nodes that are important when you're talking about decentralization and security of the network. The next kind of node is an archival node. And these are nodes that store the entire blockchain. And this allows them to run a software called the indexer which is basically an additional layer of software that allows people to query the entire blockchain. So if you're running a D app, it might be important that you can query old information about other transactions or other assets, um, other applications. So if you have an archival node, you can query any information that ever happened on the blockchain. And this can't be done on participation nodes because they only have the last 1,000 blocks. And then finally, we have relay nodes, and these nodes don't participate in consensus. What they do is they route traffic within the network. So essentially, they uh, are just to ingest for data, and then they spread it out across different participation nodes. And this is what helps the network run fast and uh, reliably, rather than just relying on the peer-to-peer -peer connection between participation nodes. So it should be also mentioned that relay nodes, there's uh, about... Uh, I think 120, whereas partition pace, participation nodes, there's about uh, 1,200, I think, last time I looked. So there are a lot of participation nodes. There are less relay nodes, but still a good amount. But the thing with relay nodes is that they don't affect uh, the consensus mechanism itself. So the when you're talking about decentralization, the main thing to focus on is participation nodes, which we have a lot of. So for the consensus, this is kind of the you know, meat of what makes a blockchain you know, secure and decentralized. And the consensus mechanism here is called pure proof of stake. And how it works is basically the probability of participation for any given account is proportional to their stake or otherwise proportional to their algo balance. So each algo in an account generates what is essentially a lottery ticket. 
the uh, VRF or verifiable random function. And this basically means that for every algo you have, a random number is generated. And if you get the winning number, then you can participate in consensus. And the important part here of the VRF is the V or the verifiable part. And so since every algo is generating a unique number, you need to be able to tell the network that you actually generated that number the correct way. And so other participants in the network can verify that you do indeed have a legitimate lottery ticket. So if you do win the so-and-so lottery, uh, what you do is you participate in a step of consensus. So in pure proof of stake, there are three steps. The first of which is block proposal, which is basically taking a look at the transactions, putting them together in a block and saying, this is what the block next block in the blockchain should be. The next step is taking the proposed blocks and filtering them out. So figuring out which blocks are actually valid and which blocks have legitimate transactions. And then finally, there's a quorum and certification. And this is basically the step where the network decides which block is actually going to be added to the blockchain. And it's important to note that each of these three steps has different people participating. So if someone wanted to attack the network and attack people participating in consensus, there's no way to know who's going to participate in the next step. So when a block proposal happens, you can see who proposed the block, but it's going to be someone different that filters the blocks. So that's a mitigation of an attack vector where someone could potentially attack a participator. In Algorand, there's no way to know who's going to be participating next. Okay, so that's kind of a high-level overview of how the network works in consensus. Uh, so let's start talking about the layer one features and what's available to you as someone building on Algorand. Uh, so the first feature is Algorand standard assets. And these are basically native assets for NFTs and fungible tokens. So this basically means that on other chains, you have smart contracts that are NFTs. They're just standardized layouts for smart contracts that act as NFTs. And on Algorand, the NFTs or any sort of asset and we like to call them ASAs for Algorand Standard Asset. Any ASA is a blockchain primitive. It's native to the blockchain and to the protocol, and you're not relying on a smart contract to represent a token. It's actually a native asset itself. So you don't have to worry about smart contract vulnerabilities or um, you know anything related to potential problems with smart contracts when you're talking about standard assets, which most people use as NFTs or fungible tokens. Then we also support atomic transactions. So this lets you group 16 transactions together. And basically, since they're atomic, if one transaction fails, the entire group fails. And this is really useful in cases where you want to do something like an atomic swap, so like selling something, or you want to do a flash loan. And there's a lot of interesting use cases, especially with smart contracts. And speaking of smart contracts, there's also this feature that I'll expound upon a little bit later, but it's called inner transactions. And this basically lets the smart contract itself send a transaction on its own. And with leveraging inner transactions, you can send up a group up to 256 atomic transactions. So this basically means you can have 256 transactions grouped together. And if one of them fails, they'll all fail. Another interesting layer one feature of Algorand is rekeying. And this basically lets addresses be transferred to another private key. So for example, if, uh, if Alice has an account that has a bunch of NFTs, some assets, some algo, and she no longer wants to use it, wants to give it to Bob, rather than manually transferring out all the assets to Bob, what she can do is she can rekey the account to Bob, and then Bob can then sign transactions using his own private key for Alice's previous account. So this is an easy way to basically change who has control over a certain address. And then finally, we have smart contracts, which is what the majority of this presentation is going to be going over. So before we go into the, the details of smart contracts, it's important to understand the environment in which they're executing. So if you're not familiar uh, with, with Algorand, uh, you might be surprised to hear that it's not EVM compatible. So this basically means we don't use Solidity and you can't easily port Ethereum applications onto Algorand because it executes in a completely different environment. Uh, and our environment is called the Algorand Virtual Machine. And all the smart contracts 
that execute in the Algorand virtual machine are written in Teal or the transaction execution approval language. And Teal itself is an assembly-like language for writing smart contracts. And if you're familiar with writing an assembly-like language, you probably think that sounds terrible. And the good news is that we do have a Python library for writing Teal as well. So it's not the only option for writing smart contracts, but Teal is kind of the base layer of what smart contracts are written in. So uh, when a smart contract is executing in the AVM, we have uh, a couple of different groups of data available to the transaction or to the smart contract. The first of which is transaction information. Uh, so like sender, receiver, the amount, fee, stuff like that. Then we have global variables. So stuff about the blockchain itself. And then we have save state, which is basically things that you manually save to smart contract. And I'll talk about all three of these things a little bit more in depth as I expound upon how smart contracts work a bit later. Um, but basically in the AVM, you have access to a couple of different uh, areas of information regarding the blockchain and the current transaction. So the AVM itself is Turing complete, which means it's capable of basically doing anything given enough time and memory. But we impose some constraints on smart contract execution to prevent you know, a single transaction from taking too long to execute or taking over the resources of a node. So the kind of two constraints we have are opcode budget and state access. So opcode budget, how this works is basically every operation you do on chain uh, takes away from the smart contracts opcode budget. So simple operations like adding, subtracting, uh, comparing two values, those just consume what's considered one opcode budget. Uh, but more complex operations such as like SHA-256 or you know, verifying private key um, or verifying signatures with a private key, those require uh, some more computational resources. Therefore, they have a higher opcode cost. So when you're executing a smart contract, you have a certain opcode cost available or opcode budget available to you. I believe for applications, it's 1900. And then that basically means you have that much uh, operations to work with. And then once you run out, the transaction will fail. And then another constraint that we have is state access. So when you call a smart contract and you want to access other information on the chain, you have to specify what kind of information you're going to be accessing. So for example, if you wanted to see the balance in Alice's account when you call a smart contract, when you form the transaction and before you send it, you need to tell the network that you're going to be reading state from Alice's account. And this is just another way to limit how much resources the smart contract is actually consuming. This is really different from other languages um, or other blockchains, I should say, that are gas based. So for example, on Ethereum, the, the limitation of the computational power of any given smart contract is limited by the gas cost, right? It's If it's uh, uneconomical to do a transaction, then that transaction won't be done. Uh, with Algorand, there's no get concept of gas. Everything costs the same 0 0.001 algo, and the limitations, rather than being fee-based, are these hard-coded limitations that could potentially change in the future. Uh, but for now, these are limitations you have to consider when making an application. So with the smart contract on Algorand, there are a couple different modes that we'd like to um, that you can use, and we call them two main things: logic signatures and applications. So for logic signatures, these are stateless smart contracts, and by stateless we mean anything you do within a given call of a logic signature won't be available in the next one. So you can't save information. Uh, there's no concept of like variables or storage. Um, so the two types of stateless logic signatures you can have are delegated approval, which lets you sign transactions from a standard account, and contract account, which signs transactions from a contract account. And I'll be going over more in depth how those two work in the next two slides. Uh, but basically, logic signatures are alternative to private keys. So normally when you want to send funds, you need to sign it with your private key. And what logic signatures are, instead of signing a transaction with a, a private key, you're signing it with logic. So the transaction will only be signed under 
the logic that is defined in the smart contract. And then in addition to stateless logic signatures, we also have stateful applications. And these are similar to logic signatures, except we actually allow save state. So you can save variables and you can read state as well. And then we also have a feature of logging. And one thing I forgot to mention here is inner transactions as well. And those are all possible in stateful applications, but not in stateless logic signatures. So this is an example of a delegated logic signature. So this is a stateless smart contract. And as I said, um, logic signatures are used to sign and approve transactions. So in this case, uh, in the next couple of examples, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at a scenario where Alice wants to send Bob algo, but she doesn't necessarily want to manually sign the transaction. Right? She wants to let Bob basically take the algo whenever is convenient for him, rather than Alice manually signing the transaction. This is kind of a weird use case and not something you would use like practically, but this is a very simple example of how the different kind of smart contracts work. So for a delegated logic signature, as I mentioned, this allows a uh, transaction to be spent on behalf of a standard account. So how it works is Alice will create a logic signature and then she'll sign it. And this will then be sent to Bob. So She'll basically write the smart contract, sign it, and then send it to Bob. And then some amount of time passes. And then Bob can form a transaction that is an algo payment from Alice to Bob and submit it to the network while it's signed by the logic signature. And when this transaction is signed by the logic signature, it will then trigger the payment out of Alice's account to Bob. So the important thing to note here is that this basically lets anyone spend from your account if you if they have that logic signature. And so one of the reasons why you might want to use an application over a logic signature is security risks. As you can imagine, in this scenario, Alice is sending Bob a logic signature that lets him withdraw any amount of algo from her account. Obviously, she doesn't want Bob taking all of her money. She doesn't want Bob closing the account. Uh, she doesn't want Bob signing up for smart contracts that she doesn't want to be a part of. So there's a lot of security concerns when you're talking about logic signatures, especially delegated logic signatures. So the next kind of logic signature is called the contract account. And this is similar in the sense that you have a smart contract that acts as a signatory for a transaction, except in this case, instead of spending directly from Alice's account, it spends from a contract sp specific account. So how this works is Alice will create a logic signature that can pay Bob. And when she creates the logic signature, it will have an account or an address associated with it that she can fund. So this is an address that looks like any other account, but it's only be it's only can be spent from the logic signature itself. So she funds this contract account, then she sends Bob the logic signature. And then as time passes, Bob can then use the logic signature whenever he wants to submit a transaction that'll trigger a payment from the contract account to Bob. So this is similar in the sense that Bob can use this logic signature to sign a transaction that can spend money from an account, except with contract accounts, instead of spending directly from Alice, Alice needs to manually fund the contract account itself. It should be noted that anyone can fund the contract account but in this example, it would be Alice that funds it. Then finally, we have the application. So this is the stateful smart contract. And this is really the one that is uh, probably going to be used the most by people watching. And it's probably the most common and what you want to use for building a dApp on Algorand. And this wasn't always the case, but applications have gained more and more features to the point where it just makes more sense to use applications in most scenarios especially when you consider the security implications I previously talked about. So this functions like a smart contract like you would think about on other chains. So basically, Alice creates an application. She then funds that account, similar to the last logic signature. Every application has its own account. And then she tells Bob the app ID. So she's not actually sending Bob the physical logic itself. What she's doing is telling Bob the application ID that he can then call. So some time can pass, and then he can make a call to that uh, to that application ID, and then that smart contract can then trigger an algo payment from the app account to Bob. And I know I went over those pretty fast, 
And again, the goal isn't that you can walk away, you know, ready to build an algorand. It's just the high level overview of how it works. And the main takeaway here is that app stateful applications are probably uh, what you're going to be most interested in when you're building on Algorand. And when you make a stateful application, it has its own app ID that anyone can call, and it has its own account that only the application can spend from. So a little bit more information about stateful applications because they're probably going to be the most used kind of smart contract. So on the left here, we can see kind of the input of the transaction itself. So for stateful application, there are a couple different things you need to provide to the transaction itself. Uh, you first need to provide these three arrays here. And these are kind of the state limitations I was talking about earlier. So for example, if you wanted to access Alice's account in the smart contract, we need to pass her address here in the accounts array. And the same thing goes for applications. If you wanted to access another state of an application, you need to pass in the application array. If you wanted to access information about an asset, you need to pass it in the assets array. And again, these are just limitations to predefine what sort of data the smart contract itself is going to be reading. So that way, when it executes on the network, it doesn't take up too much resources. And then this fourth array here is a bit different. It's an arguments array. And this kind of works like, um, as you would expect, any sort of argument on a function call to work. So when you call a smart contract, you can provide it with data that it can then use during execution. So it's basically the same thing as providing arguments to a function or argv on the command line. It's basically just custom data that you can input into the transaction and into the application call. So once you send the transaction, what will happen is that the TO program, uh, which is basically the logic that defines a smart contract will execute. And then during execution, during runtime, uh, you have uh, these two things that you can read and write from. So you have global and local state, which I'll talk about a bit further. And then you have temporary scratch space. And this is basically just temporary variables that you don't need to save. And you can read and write those things. And as you're reading and writing, it's uh, either consuming or pushing data on the memory stack. And then you can also read data and put it on the memory stack from global variables, oops, from global variables or uh, transaction properties, which I will talk a little bit more in depth in the next couple of slides. So when you first create an app, uh, there's a couple additional things that you must do uh, that's different from just calling an app. So when you create an app, there are kind of two programs that you must define. The first of which is an approval program, and this basically is the program that executes during application calls. So this is kind of the meat of the program, and it basically defines what the smart contract does, what the application does. And then we also have a clear program, and this is logic separate from the approved program that defines basically if the end user wants to clear all the state that the uh, smart contract uses, the clear program is a logic that's executed to do so. In addition to app creation, we must define a schema. So when you create an app, you need to define what kind of ins, uh, what kind of data you're going to be saving. So the two data types in teal and thus in smart contracts are integers and byte arrays. And you can basically think of byte arrays kind of like strings. They're kind of uh, very similar. So uh, you must predefine how many ints you're going to be saving and how many byte arrays you're going to be saving. And then again, you got to provide the arguments, assets, accounts, and apps, as I previously discussed. So once you create the smart contract, what kind of information does it have access to? And I kind of already discussed this a little bit. But again, uh, there's a couple of different areas of information that any given smart contract has access to. So the first of which is transaction information. So this is the sender, the amount, the receiver, basically any, any sort of metadata about the transaction itself the smart contract will have access to. And with grouped uh, transactions, as I mentioned, you can have 16 transactions grouped atomically together. You can also read information about other transactions. So you could have a group where it's an application call and then a payment. And that application call also has access to all the information about the payment. So this is useful if you're doing something like an auction, you can have an app call that specifies your bidding and then you can verify that the bid did indeed go through. 
um, within the logic of the smart contract. So uh, in addition to transaction information, we also have information about applications. So you can get uh, information about the programs itself. So what kind of logic he's executing. You can get the schema. You can get um, the address of the application. So this is the, the account that the application can spend from and all sorts of various information about the application itself. And then you also have asset information. So if you're wanting to look up information about an NFT or a fungible token, you can learn about um, who the creator is, how much of it exists, how much is in circulation, the name, et cetera. And then you can get account information. So for any given account, you can see what the current balance is, what the minimum balance is. And this is basically the minimum balance it must maintain in order to participate or in order to uh, function in the network. And then uh, you can get the address for the account. So this is the address that you, you know, send, send funds from. And then finally, we have global variables. And these are essentially uh, variables about the blockchain itself. So you can get things like the current round, what the latest timestamp was, what the minimum fee is, and stuff like that. So this is basically just a, a way to get information about the blockchain as a whole uh, globally uh, when executing a smart contract. So in addition to all those information and variables that you can read, uh, we also have read-write capabilities and we call this storage. So the uh, kind of three areas of storage are global storage, local storage, and scratch space. Uh, so the first two, global and local storage, are state storage. And basically, uh, they are limited to 128 bytes per key plus value. So if you have a key that is one byte, you then have 127 bytes to work with for the value. And these uh, both local and global storage can be read by anyone on and off chain. So one smart contract can read the state of another, smart contract can read the state of itself, and anyone can look at a, an explorer or an indexer and query information about state for a given application. So the two kites of uh, storage, we have global storage and local storage. So global storage is basically storage that is per app ID or per application instance. So basically every application has 64 key value pairs. And that basically lets you save 64 different kinds of values that can be referenced by keys. And again, these are 128 bytes per key plus value. And then we also have local storage, where it's 16 key value pairs per account. So with global storage, it's just per app. So a given app can only have 64 key value pairs in global storage, and that's it. But hey, any given application can have, theoretically, unlimited local storage. So what this basically means is if you have a smart contract that's being used by, let's say, a 1,000 people, you would still have 64 key value pairs. But if all those 1,000 people use local storage, you would have a total of 16,000 key value pairs. And the important thing about local storage is that it maps to an account. So when you're referencing it on chain, you need to define which account you want to read the storage from, and then you can specify which key you're reading. An important thing about local storage is that accounts must specifically opt in. So the storage space here, uh, unlike global storage, when you create a contract, you need to pay for it. Um, but local storage, it is essentially paid for by the end user that's using that storage. And when we say pay for, what this basically is, is an increase in minimum balance. So it's essentially a value of algo that is locked in their account that they cannot spend. So they're essentially renting that space out for local storage. And when we say accounts must opt in, it's basically a special transaction that locks that algo in and ensures that that algo cannot leave their account as they're using that local storage. Then finally, we have scratch space, and this is just temporary runtime storage. So um, these are basically just uh, local variables that as soon as a transaction is finished or an application call is finished, that all that data in scratch space is erased. And so opting in, as I previously mentioned, uh, local storage requires a minimum balance. And how much of a balance that requires is calculated with the formula. I said formula below, but I took out the formula. But uh, it's basically a formula based on the schema. So depending on how many integers and how many byte arrays you're going to be saving, 
you're going to have uh, more or less minimum balance required. And again, minimum balance is basically just saying how much algo do you need locked in your account in order to use this local storage. So opting in requires a specific transaction. So it does require a, um, a specific transaction to the application. So you do need to pay the fee or 0 0.001 algo, which again is like a 40th of a penny. So it's not really a big deal. And then um, it's important to note that for local storage, any account can clear the storage at any time. So if you're using local storage um, for bookkeeping, it's important to know that the end user can erase that data at any time they want. So you have to be really careful about what you're saving in local storage and make sure you're okay with the end user being able to erase it. So another functionality of stateful applications is inner transactions. And these are basically transactions that can be sent programmatically within the logic of a smart contract. And inner transactions can be any type of transaction. So it can be another application call. So you can have one application call another. It can be a payment. So you can have an application pay someone. And it can be an asset transfer. So you can you know, transfer NFTs with an application. And this is really useful uh, when you're doing things like staking or auctions or selling something, right? These inner transactions make it really easy to programmatically uh, do some type of transaction or do something on the blockchain based upon what you program the logic to do. And in addition to inner transactions and state, we also have logging. And logging is an uh, interesting feature of stateful application that has a couple of different uses. Uh, so the first one is kind of just like the austere definition of logging, and that's just saving information to a transaction. So when you log something, anyone on or off chain can see what you logged. Um, so if you're executing a smart contract, you want to log what the smart contract is doing, you can do so. Um, but in addition to just logging information, it's also uh, useful for returning values. So an example of this is if you have Alice wants to call a application that leverages an Oracle. So you have some smart contract that needs to read data from an Oracle. What you can essentially do is have the app send an inner transaction to an Oracle. Uh, Oracle will then log the value. And then the application itself can then read the logged value and essentially use that log as return value. And there's standard ways of doing this, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, but basically the point is that logging is essentially a great way to communicate between two smart contracts and thus to return values from one smart contract to another. So one of um, the cool things about Algorand is that we have a open set of standards called ARCs. And one of the ARCs is ARC4, and that is an ABI, or an Application Binary Interface. And so what this allows is uh, more dynamic and more interesting types to be um, allowed in smart contracts. So as I mentioned earlier, the two types for the AVM is a byte array or integer. And um, as you might guess, there are some use cases where you want to do something a little bit more. Uh, for example, you might want to have a tuple, or you might want to have uh, an integer that isn't 64 bits. Um, you might want to have a Boolean value. And all these kind of types are defined in that standard. And what the standard essentially does is tells people how to encode and decode these types uh, in the AVM or using teal. So this is essentially an expansion on the you know, foundational layer of what the AVM of ca is capable of and it allows uh, applications to have more, um, more comprehensive types. And if you're just building a teal, like I said, it's a specific standard of encoding and decoding that you need to follow. But in higher level languages, so like we have our PyTeal library, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the future, but the, the PyTeal library is essentially a Python library that lets you write teal with Python. We have helper methods for making these types very easily. Um, so essentially the ABI, when integrated to higher level languages, is a way to add more native types to the smart contract that you're writing. 
And a nice thing about the ABI as well is that also defines a schema for defining what a smart contract does. So uh, in this example, this is a JSON description of a smart contract. And here, the smart contract itself is called super awesome contract. And here it defines the network. So what this JSON file is basically doing is saying, hey, we have the super awesome contract on mainnet. The app ID is one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we have some methods that you can call. So the first method here is called add. You can add two integers and it takes in two 64-bit integers, unsigned bit, uh, two 64-bit unsigned integers, uh, and then returns uh, UN64 as well. So as you can see here, what this does is it defines um, and standardizes a way to define methods that are callable in smart contracts. So if you wanted someone to use your application, what you could do is you could create this JSON file that tells them what the methods are, what they do, what kind of types they take in, and then they can use that in SDKs or in other smart contracts to more easily call and interact with your smart contracts. And having a standardized way to do this allows us to have better interoperability. As I talked about, for example, with logging return values, there's a standardized way to find in the ABI specification that tells you how to do that. So it's essentially at a high level, the ABI is just a standard for helping people interact with smart contracts a little bit more user-friendly way. So we also have some features coming soon. Um, these are features that aren't yet implemented, but they will be coming soon. And they're kind of important to keep in mind when considering building on Algorand. So the first of which is called boxes. And this is a pretty big paradigm shift in how storage will work on Algorand. So as I pre previously mentioned, we have global and local storage, but they have some limitations. Primarily, uh, any key value pair is only 128 bytes. And with global storage, you're only talking about 64 key value pairs. So it's pretty limited in terms of what you can save uh, per contract. Boxes, on the other hand, are have a little bit less constraints. So boxes are essentially, you can have unlimited key value pairs of boxes, and you can storage large amounts of arbitrary data. The exact amount of data that you can store per box is all kind of up in the air. Um, last I heard, it was a couple of kilobytes, but that probably be tweaked upon official release. Um, but the point is it's much more than just 64, 128 byte key value pairs. Uh, it's a lot more dynamic. And one of the interesting things about boxes as well is that on-chain reading is permissioned. And what I mean by this is that boxes can only be read by the application itself. So if you have an Oracle, for example, Right now, if you were to implement an Oracle and Algorand, basically anyone on chain could read information about that Oracle for free on or off chain. Uh, what boxes do is it allows you allows the Oracle to permission access to that data on chain. So you could have something like an Oracle that will only give you the data if you pay it a certain amount of algo or if you transfer an NFT um, or if you meet some sort of logic or you're on a a whitelist or you know however you want to permission that data boxes since they can only be read by the application itself therefore they must be returned via a log message uh, there's a lot more flexibility in terms of uh, choosing how it's read on chain and then also of course since it's a blockchain they can be read off chain by anyone so you can use an indexer or block explorer to take a look at what sort of data is stored in the boxes of any given contract. And then also coming soon is state proofs. And these are um, basically proofs of the state of the Algorand network as a whole. And what this essentially allows is for other chains to verify the state of the Algorand network. And this is really useful in instances like bridges, for example. If you wanted to have a bridge that you take an Ethereum NFT, send it to an Ethereum smart contract, and then bring it on algo or vice versa, um, you know, bring an algo NFT onto Ethereum. State proofs are a great way to do that because they're a relatively low computationally intensive um, operation that is relatively easy to verify for the state of Algorand. So you can verify that this account does indeed 
have this NFT and you can, you know, execute logic programmatically based on that. And one other thing that I should mention uh, that's coming soon is also going to be randomness. So right now we don't have a true, like great method of generating random numbers on chain. Um, but in the next couple of months, we should see a um, randomness functionality coming to smart contracts. So uh, this will be a way to generate uh, random numbers useful in a lot of different cases for games and lotteries. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of use cases for that as well. So that's kind of a high level, like anatomy of smart contract and how they work and what they do. Um, in terms of the language itself, this is what Teal looks like. So again, Teal is kind of the base language that the AVM interprets and compiles into bytecode for execution. And this is what a Teal program looks like. What this program is doing is doing two minus one and then returning the value. So um, the first line here is essentially just metadata. We're telling the AVM that we're executing version six, which as of the time of this presentation is the latest version. And then as you can see, each operation here is on its own line. So as I mentioned, this is an assembly like language. So how this basically works is when you run the int two operation, so the int is the operation and then we're giving an argument of two. What this int operation does is pushes an integer onto the memory stack. So when we run int two on the memory stack, we'll have an integer two. Then we run int one on the stack, we'll still have our two, but now we'll also have a one. So the stack will have a two and then a one. And then this subtraction operation, as you might've guessed, subtracts the two values on the stack. So this will consume those two values on the stack. So the stack will be empty as it's executing. And then it will put the return value back on the stack. So the return value of two minus one is one. So we'll be leaving a one on the stack. And then when we call return, since there's a one on the stack, which is a non-zero value, uh, that means the program uh, was successful. So again, all TO basically is, is one operation per line with each operating consuming or adding data to the memory stack. As you might've guessed, uh, this can get pretty complex, pretty quick. Like right now, just in two and one minus, that's you know pretty self-explanatory. But as you have more complex uh, applications with a lot of conditional branching and functions and um, a lot of, like just a lot of logic within the contract itself, writing in raw teal can be a little bit confusing because it's, uh, a little bit hard to organize and especially can be hard to read. So that's where PyTeal comes in. So as I mentioned, PyTeal is a Python library for writing uh, Teal itself. So this is just an example of a very, very basic a, a smart contract. And what this is essentially doing is we're defining our approval and clear programs. So our approval program is just going to be int two minus int one. So this is essentially what we're seeing here. The return int two minus int one is the same thing as this teal, except it's in Python. And as you can imagine, as you get more complex applications, you can use features of Python, such as like method definitions or classes to really organize the logic a little bit better. Then you also have some higher abstractions like for things such as the API um, that makes writing in PyT a little bit more digestible and a little bit more readable. And when you're writing your smart contract, I think readability is an important thing to consider um, since kind of the paradigm of, you know, the blockchain is open source and everything publicly available. It's important that you make your smart contracts readable and easily digestible. So when people are executing them, they understand what they're executing. PyT is a great way to do that. So in addition to PyTeal, we also have a couple other tools. So of course, you know, PyTeal, it generates Teal. And then we also have some SDKs for interacting with the blockchain itself. So like um, forming transactions, submitting transactions, reading data from the blockchain. Um, so the first of which is our JavaScript SDK. And this is what you're going to be using in like a lot of web-based dApps. Um, and then we also have Go, Python, and Java. And those four are our main official SDKs that are supported by Algorand. And then we also have some community SDKs. 
So these are SDKs that aren't written or supported by Algorand as a first party, uh, but something we support um, you know, as part of our community. So we have app, um, SDKs for Dart, .NET, PHP, Rust, Swift, Unity, um, and I'm sure there's even more that I'm not aware of. Uh, but basically, whatever language you're writing in, you can generally find an SDK. And even if you can't find an SDK, all the interaction with the Algorand blockchain uses uh, REST API endpoints from a node. Um, so if the language supports HTTP REST calls, uh, you can then you know interact with the blockchain. So for wallets, the official wallet is Para, and this is a mobile only wallet. So if someone is using a dApp that integrates with Para, in order to connect the dApp to the Para wallet, they use something called Wallet Connect. And if you're not familiar with Wallet Connect, this is basically if you want the user to sign a transaction with Para, it shows them a QR code, they scan it with their phone, they sign it, and then the transaction goes through. And we have some unofficial, or I should say, you know, third-party wallets. So these aren't wallets that are, um, you know, these aren't the official wallets, but uh, these are wallets that are reputable and common wallets that are used by a lot of applications. So the first of which is my Algo, and this is a web-based wallet. So this works in a web browser without the need for any extension. And I believe it also works on mobile browsers as well. So it's a you know device agnostic wallet that should work on any device that has access to a web browser, um, assuming you know you can run JavaScript and whatever other libraries it needs to run. And then you have Algo Signer, uh, which is a Chrome extension, and it's a bit of a less feature complete wallet, right? It's not um, the same in terms of like the UI it has to offer of Para and My Algo, but it's a very quick way to sign transactions within a Chrome based browser. Then another very important tool, uh, which will probably be one of the first tools you get your hands on when you start building on Algorand, is the Sandbox. And this is basically a Docker based. Um, application that spins up a node for development. So it's a, basically a script that leverages Docker Compose and spins up a node that creates a private network and you can interact with that private network uh, during development for you know, testing, call, testing calls and debugging applications, stuff like that. Um, and then one other tool worth mentioning is Reach. So Reach is kind of an alternative to PyTeal or Teal. And it's a way to write smart contracts. But the interesting thing about Reach is that it's a JavaScript-based library that can be used for writing both the front end and the back end logic for your application. And it can also um, optionally compile down to Solidity as well. So again, Reach is JavaScript-based and it's a little bit higher level of abstraction. But if you're more familiar with like Web2, this might be an interesting place to play around with Algorand because it is entirely JavaScript based. So now the next steps, um, you know, now that you're you know, kind of familiar with Algorand and how smart contracts work at a very high level, you know, where do you go kind of learn the next steps and learn more about Algorand? And see, though, these are all um, these are all different areas that you can go to to get educational content. And um, right now, um, obviously, you can't go to them because I'm presenting this. But after the presentation, I will share a copy of these links or a copy of the presentation in the Discord. So if you're not in the Discord, I'll have a QR code to join that later in the presentation. Um, but basically, these are the uh, primary educational resources that you go to right now to learn more about Algorand. So uh, we have Algo Academy, and this is basically just a uh, combination of various resources that you can use to learn more about Algorand. We have an Algorand Marketplace tutorial, and this is kind of a written tutorial that's step through steps walking you how to develop on Algorand. Uh, we also have some resources from AlgoHub. So AlgoHub is someone that we work closely with, and they offer a PyTeal course, as well as a lot of resources for Reach itself. And then on our YouTube, we have a Zero to Hero PyTeal course. So this is basically the in-depth of starting from nothing. How do you set up your dev environment? How do you start using PyTeal to build smart contracts? Uh, so on and so forth. So that's a really great place if you're interested in building with PyTeal. And then finally, we have Algorand School. 
And this is a uh, basically a slide deck presentation that's a little bit more in depth than what you saw today. It has a lot of slides about um, the history of Algorand, um, how consensus works, how TO and PI TO work. Um, overall, just a great place to read through and get a really good idea of how Algorand itself works. And then we have some uh, resources. These are uh, more general resources that are good places to look when you want to learn more about Algorand. Uh, not really formalized education, but just areas that you can go to learn more information. So the first of which is the Algorand Discord. If you're participating in the green hack, Greenhouse Hack, I strongly recommend you join this server. We have a Greenhouse Hack um, specific channel. And then in addition to the Greenhouse Hack area, we also have a bunch of channels for support regarding various aspects of the Algorand network and developers. Um, so definitely join that. Great place to talk with um, people from the foundation. So people like myself or people from the Inc, uh, whether they're engineers or also developer relation engineers. Um, you can talk to a lot of really smart people and learn a lot about Algorand there. And then we also have the developer portal. And this is basically our main website for tutorials, articles, blog posts. Uh, a lot of information can be learned there. A great place to try to find some examples and you know practices on how to build a smart contract. And then we have our own form. So this is an Algorand form focused on developers that uh, you can go to to get support and ask questions and engage with the community. And then we have our YouTube channel, so youtube.com slash Algorand. And this is where we have um, this is where we have a lot of uh, educational content. We have some podcasts, uh, some recorded office hours, um, basically a lot of content there that you can learn from. And then for GitHub, we have kind of three repositories that are worth checking out. So the first of which is Algorand DevRel or Algorand Dash DevRel. And this has um, a ton of examples for building on Algorand. So smart contract examples, front end examples, um, you know, examples using the Python SDK, JavaScript SDK, you name it. There's probably an example on Algorand DevRel somewhere. Uh, and then there's the Algorand repository, which has uh, the code base for the SDKs and the node software itself. And then we have the Algorand Foundation repository. And this is where things like um, the standards that I mentioned, the ARCs reside, and you can uh, participate in the discussion for these standards and um, you know give your feedback. Likewise, on any of the repository, we love to hear feedback, whether it's on software or tutorial or what have you. Um, these are great places to interact with the people building um, on Algorand and to give them your feedback. And then for Twitter, um, the main account, if you're a developer, you want to follow is Algo Devs. And this account will be tweeting out information uh, specific to developers um, about Algorand. So you definitely want to follow that account if you're building on Algorand. Okay, so that is the conclusion of this presentation. I do see there is one question in the chat that I can address. So. Um, the question is, do we have to run a node to build a smart contract? Uh, no, you, you do not have to build a node to run a, uh, to build a smart contract, uh, but you do need a node to run a smart contract. Uh, the nice thing about um, you know building on Algorand is that there's a couple of different services that make nodes publicly available. So if you wanted to submit a transaction on testnet without having to set up a node yourself, there are services such as Algo Explorer, Algo node, pure stake, that'll let you submit transactions for free without having to uh, run a node yourself. And if you want to learn a little bit more about those, uh, go to the Discord and ask about it, and I'll be happy to help you. Um, and I believe that is all the questions. Um, yes, I don't see any more questions here uh, in the Q&A. Um, so I think if there's no more questions, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close out the session. And I do want to thank you, Joe, for sharing uh, such great information and so many great resources. Um, and like you said that you were going, you were going to share the presentation on Discord? Yes, yes, I will. Okay. Perfect. So make sure you join the Algorand Discord uh, so you can see, you know, you can have a presentation on there as well. Um, and with that, I think we're going to end the session. So thank you everyone for joining and keep an eye out on Discord for additional workshops uh, coming up uh, and have a great day. Bye. All right. Thanks everyone.